You know what our politics needs right now? It's someone that exudes authenticity and a consistent political platform. Well, we may need to go back in time for that because this timeless clip of Donald Trump from all the way back in 1988 offers a sharp contrast to the current president, Joe Biden, and the Democratic nominee with Kamala Harris. So subscribe to the channel, take a look at this before we dive in. And by the way, I'm at my parents' house during Hurricane Helene, so forgive the background. Let's jump in. You took out a full page ad in uh, major U.S. newspapers uh, last year criticizing U.S. foreign policy. What would you do differently, Donald? I'd make our allies, forgetting about the enemies, the enemies you can't talk to so easily. I'd make our allies pay their fair share. We're a debtor nation. Something's going to happen over the next number of years with this country because you can't keep going on losing $200 billion, and yet we, we let Japan come in and dump everything right into our markets and everything. It's not free trade. If you ever go to Japan right now and try to sell something, forget about it, Oprah. Just forget about it. It's almost impossible. They don't have laws against it, they just make it impossible. They come over here, they sell their cars, their VCRs, they knock the hell out of our companies. And hey, I have tremendous respect for the Japanese people. I mean, you can respect somebody that's beating the hell out of you, but they are beating the hell out of this country. Kuwait, they live like kings. The poorest person in Kuwait, they live like kings. And yet they're not paying. We make it possible for them to sell their oil. Why aren't they paying us 25% of what they're making? It's a joke. Now you know one thing, that unapologetic assertiveness stretches all the way back nearly 40 years ago, far before Donald Trump had any political ambitions, and that means it was never an act. But I want to pick at something deeper here because there's two layers to what he said. For one, Donald Trump's fundamental philosophy to politics rings very similar to business, which is treating everything like a deal, and in that, Trump has a particular aversion and paranoia to getting ripped off by someone. And to do that, he goes overboard in the opposite direction, and you just heard an example of that yourself. I'm reminded of a quote from Donald Trump's book, The Art of the Deal, that he wrote just a few months before this interview. It speaks to his approach to negotiating, saying, and I quote, My style of deal making is quite simple and straightforward. I am very high, and I then just keep pushing and pushing and pushing to get what I'm after. Combine that with this idea that the greatest leverage in negotiation is the ability to walk away, and you realize the common thread that connects not just Trump, the businessman, to Trump, the politician, but also from 1988 all the way to today. Oprah Winfrey here seemed to have picked up on Donald Trump's potential foray into politics, which is why Trump's response next, with the self-conviction, is referenced even today. If someone told you this clip was recent, you wouldn't be able to tell just by going off his approach to politics and his place in it. This sounds like political presidential talk to me, and I know people have talked to you about whether or not you want to run. Would you, would you ever? Probably not, but I, I do get tired of seeing the country ripped Why off. Why would you not? I just don't think... I really have the inclination to do it. I love what I'm doing. I really like it. Also, I, it doesn't pay as well. No, it doesn't. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I just probably wouldn't do it, Oprah. I probably wouldn't, but I do get tired of seeing what's happening with this country. And if it got so bad, I would never want to rule it out totally because I really am tired of seeing what's happening with this country, how we're how we're really making other people live like kings and we're not. You sense almost a degree of ego and arrogance to him even then, which translates into a kind of national ego that he's in power. Now, of course, that's not without its downsides because we've seen Donald Trump ramp up trade wars with nations like China and France in his presidency. But wouldn't you take that over a meek and timid global standing for America under a president of Biden that we see today? The truth that too many people fail to understand is that foreign policy is not made unilaterally. It is made in response to the incentive structure laid out by your allies and opponents. If countries like Russia and China, which represent a new global pole, are being cunning and conniving in strengthening themselves, the U.S. will be forced to step up if it wants to compete. And it's at a time like this. When someone like Donald Trump at the helm of the country makes sense, despite all of the side effects of his brash and unpredictable persona. Even back nearly 40 years ago, that's exactly what made Donald Trump declare that he'd win an election if he ever ran. You've said, though, that if you did run for president, you believe you'd win. Well, I don't know. I think I'd win. I tell you what, I wouldn't go in to lose. I've never gone in to lose in my <laughs> life. And, and if I did decide to do it, I think I'd be inclined, I, w I would say that I would have a hell of a chance of winning, because I think people, I don't know how your audience feels, but I think people are tired of seeing the United States ripped off. And I can't promise you everything, but I can tell you one thing, this country would make one hell of a lot of money from those people that for 25 years have taken advantage. It wouldn't be the way it's been. Same can be said for the current administration, in my opinion, because the kind of unapologetic assertiveness in Donald Trump is simply absent from someone like Joe Biden or the new Democratic nominee with Kamala Harris. Here's the deal, there's two kind of politicians, those that put forward their firm beliefs and then see who's with them, and the second kind of politician simply looks at what's popular and adapts to ride the wave of the public opinion 
right into office. Joe Biden falls firmly in the latter camp, and I'm not talking about policy positions because every politician, including Trump, has shifted on things in the last decades. That's okay. But it's about the values and principles that lie underneath. Here's a clip that Joe Biden would rather that you never saw from back in the day as his vice presidential nominee clearly laying out his opposition to same-sex marriage at the time. The president used his radio address uh, yesterday and tomorrow in the Rose Garden to talk about a constitutional amendment to ban gay marriage. You know, think about this. The world's going to Hades in a handbasket. We are desperately concerned about the circumstance relating to uh, avian flu. We don't have enough vaccines. We don't have enough police officers. And we're going to debate the next three weeks, I'm told, gay marriage, a flag amendment, and God only knows what else. I can't believe the American people can't see through this. We already have a law, the Defense of Marriage Act, where we've all voted, not where I voted and others said, look, marriage is between a man and a woman, and states must respect that. Nobody's violated that law. There's been no challenge to that law. Why do we need a constitutional amendment? Marriage is between a man and a woman. What's the game going on here? Let's try to avoid nuance, Senator. Let me do be you support gay marriage? No, Barack Obama nor I support redefining from a, from a civil side what constitutes marriage. Did have a radical political awakening in his 70s, or did he just realize that it's better to go along with the tide of culture than swimming against it? It's clearly the latter, and at some point people just stop seeing the president as the thought leader he needs to be. Politician that stands for nothing eventually falls for anything, and that's what you see with Joe Biden falling deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole, and more he needs their support to stay afloat. And we may see that go into overdrive with a potential Kamala Harris presidency because she's got an even worse record on flip-flopping an issue that will be based on political convenience. Tim Walls and I are both gun owners. We're not taking anybody's guns away. So stop with the continuous lying about this stuff. Um, I support buybacks. How mandatory is your gun buyback program? It's mandatory. I will not ban fracking. I have not banned fracking as Vice President of the United States, and in fact, I was the tie-breaking vote on the Inflation Reduction Act, which opened new leases for fracking. Will you commit to implementing a federal ban on fracking your first day in office, adding the United States to the list of countries who have banned this devastating practice? There's no question I'm in favor of banning fracking. I absolutely support, and over the last four years as vice president, private health care options. You can't blame people for just being turned off to candidates after a while and realizing that none of them really stand for the things that they claim to stand for. But the least you can do is look for someone with consistent enough values that lends them a degree of predictability. And when you narrow that down, the choice becomes relatively easier. Let me know in the comments if you agree, because I think this is one of the most important character traits that you can look at for in a political candidate.